Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at the Logids gem. This is an alternative to the audited and paper trail gems that we've covered on the channel before. Now with those, we were mostly interested in tracking when a user made a change to a specific model in our application. Today we're not going to handle the users, we're just going to be taking a look at what Logids can do for us and sort of how to configure it. So there's some subtle differences here. Uh, effectively, what you're going to be doing is adding a JSONB column to your model, and then you're going to have that track all of your changes. This is going to allow you to like revert to a previous version, check what the version of your post looked like, I don't know, like three days ago, for example, or you can revert to whatever you had this time last month for your post uh, based on how you store your information. To actually do this, let's just go ahead and let's do a uh, Rails new video and then let's do a dash D for Postgres. The reason why we're doing Postgres here is because they do mention the JSONB column, which is usually a good indicator that you're going to want to be using Postgres as opposed to like SQLite, for example, because SQLite only has a JSON column, I believe. Uh, and also if you're using like Postgres in your production for something like this with your JSONB column, you're probably going to want to just use Postgres in your development. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to have two different database types that you're developing for because uh, then your logic's going to change when you go to deploy and then you'll run into some unintended bugs and other stuff. But okay, let's go ahead and let's CD into our video, run a code dot, and then let's take a look at how to do this. So the first thing we want to do is actually add the gem. We can do this by running a bundle add for the logids gem. Uh, but we do also want to add another gem, which is actually the FX gem. And the reason why we're adding this one is because we can come in here and we can search for the FX gem, I believe. Uh, and with the FX gem, we can we can sort of see that they're using it for um, right here. They say it seamlessly integrates with the FX gem to make it possible to continue using schema.rb for the database schema dump. Now you do have the option to skip it if you don't want to use it by using dash dash no dash fix or uh, or something like that. Uh, but in our case, we'll just be fine. And the way we'll do this is we'll just we'll have both gems. We'll just assume that it's set up and configured, and then we'll go from there. Now, in terms of actually installing it, it's pretty easy. It's just going to be Rails G logids. Uh, oops, not that logids colon install should be the command, right? And now I want to talk about the thing you probably just saw, which is going to be a uh, Rails G logids uh, model right here. So you have two different ways to generate your logids model. The first one is gonna to be to just pass in something like, uh, let's say you have a post model, you're just gonna do a Rails G logids colon model and then the name of your model. This isn't gonna work if you have a structure like let's say app models and then new folder, we'll say you have a cars folder uh, and then you have like a Ford folder and then inside of that Ford folder you have like an escape.rb. Uh, so let's say you have like an, uh, an application where you've built up quite a bit of features. You have these nested directories. In that case, it's probably not going to be able to find this escape if you just try and do like escape right here. So instead, what you have to do is you have to actually pass in a dash dash path uh, argument. And then this flag is going to tell it to go to this location here. So we actually have to path it, pass in the fully qualified uh, URL relative to wherever we are or fully qualified path. So we're going to do app models cars forward and then escape.rb or whatever your subdirectory structure looks like. In this case, this should work. I'm not going to run this, of course, because I don't actually have an escape model. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these folders. I just wanted to point this out. So let's do a Rails G scaffold for our uh, post. We'll give each post a title and a body of type text just so we have something to mess around with. Uh, and now we can do a db colon migrate command to migrate our database. Oops, I don't actually have a database yet. So let's do a db create and then we can do a db colon migrate. So that should be fine. So that gives us our post. But now what we have to do is actually set up logits for it. So let's do what we just did. We'll say Rails G logits colon model for our post. This is going to automatically find it. It's going to create the migrations for us. It's going to do the triggers for us, and then it's going to insert into our models. And if we come into our post.rb, we can now see that the post has logins, which is going to give us all those methods that we need. So now what we can do is we can actually just run a Rails S uh, to start our server. But we're actually going to run into an issue here because there is one additional step, which is uh, it involves going into your config, your application.rb, and changing or setting the schema format if you don't have this set anywhere. 
So we just add a config active record schema format uh, SQL. And the reason why I had you start your server here is because I like to stress this because I always get comments about this. Whenever you change a configuration file, you do have to stop your server and restart it. If something ever doesn't work, try that first. If it still doesn't work, then feel free to ask the questions. But the number one rule in software, turn it off, turn it back on again, see if it works. 90% of the time that will solve your problem. The other 10% of the time turning it off could like blow up the entire building you're in. So probably don't do it then. But you know, if, if within reason you can stop and start the server again, it's probably a good idea to try it first. Uh, but what this is going to allow us to do is come over to localhost port 3000 slash post. We can run our pending migrations Then we can click on new post. We'll say this has a test one title with a body as the body or whatever. And that's going to give us uh, effectively nothing, interestingly enough. So you're going to see that it inserts into our posts and it does have the log data, which is coming from the log hits gem. But if we actually look at what gets inserted into the log data, you can see right here, it's nil. So if we stop our server, run a rails C and then do a post equals post dot first, we can do a post dot log data and you'll see basically just has the current state of the model inside of it. So if we do a post right here, uh, let me do it like this so you can read it a bit better. You can see we have the test one and the body, the created at, the updated at, and then we effectively have that information duplicated here, right? Uh, additionally, you can also do like a Y post if you want to, uh, which is going to give you the uh, YAML version of, of this, this model. So just learned about that one the other day, pretty neat trick. Uh, but it is kind of hard to read <laughs> depending on what, what your model looks like. So in this case, it's probably better uh, if we just stick to having like our post log data here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to update this both from the app and then we'll update it from the console. So let's go ahead and let's do a Rails S to just update it from the app real quick. I'll click on edit post. I'm going to change this to hello too. So I'm changing the word and the number so that we can see it a bit better. And now if we come in here and we check the update right here, we can see that we have a couple things being updated, uh, but you'll see the log data wasn't touched here, which is a little strange, but also a little deceptive because if we come into our Rails C, we can do a post equals post dot first again, we can do a post and then we can hopefully see, uh, let me do it like this, that our post now has the hello to as the title. And right here, we can see we have the body set to body, the title set to test one with another one down here that has a title set to hello too. So we do have two different versions being tracked here. But if we do a post.title right now, we can see it's still set to hello too, which is what it currently is. If we want to, let's say, revert it, what we can do is a post.undo. And now if we do a post.title, you'll see that changes to test one. Similarly, we can come in here and we can say redo, and that's gonna change it to hello to again. So you can use undo and redo to switch between those different versions. If we do, oops, uh, if we do a post.update and set the title to be, I don't know, foobar3, that'll update it. And now if we do a post, you'll see the title here has been set to foobar3. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna set the post equal to the post.first. I'm just gonna re-grab it, grab the post, and now I'm gonna make sure that all of my data makes sense. So I have a foobar3, a hello to, and a test one in here. That all seems fine to me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, all right, uh, for our post.title, I wanna change this from foobar3 to, uh, let's say I wanna switch this all the way back to the first version. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say post.switch underscore two, one. I'm just gonna pass on the first version. Now, if I do a post.title, you can see I've gone all the way back to test one. I can do a post.redo, right? And now if I do a post.title, you'll see I've gone to hello two. So the redo is not actually undoing the last thing that you did to it. It's moving it between the different version numbers. So don't assume that the redo and undo are like an actual clipboard redo and undo where it has your change history saved in there for what you've actually done. It's the, the versions the app uh, has gone through is what you're undoing and redoing. So to go back to version three, for example, we'd probably have to do like a redo again and then do a post.title to get back to foobar3. So that's where using the switch to probably makes a lot more sense, I would have to guess, uh, but it's ultimately gonna be like whatever you uh, wanna do. Now, there is another thing we can take a look at. Uh, I did make a note of this. If we come in here and we search for, I think it's like note that redo, we can see right here, note that redo will not work after undo append true because the latter will create a new version instead of rolling back to an old one. So if you do an append true, uh, this is going to allow you to do some interesting stuff. 
which will effectively mean that when you do your undo, it's still going to create a new version, right? Uh, so as opposed to currently where you're switching between the versions, when you do an undo like this and you create a new version, that would effectively mean if we did like a, uh, let's say post.undo, and then we say append true, then we're gonna, I would assume, have a fourth version here. So if I do a post, I come in here, we can now see we've got the uh, body, the hello to the foobar three. Uh, and if we come in here, we have the hello two right here. So now if I go to post.switch to one, I can do a post.title and I can do a post.switch to four. So we can see here, we still only have three versions here. So I don't know why this isn't working, uh, but my understanding is the redo and the undo should, uh, or the undo with the append true should cause it to do um, another append, but you can also configure it to do the append true if you want to. Uh, and this is probably something you'd want to do in like your initializer. So you'd want to have like a logids.rb initializer, and then you want to do something like put this in here and then run a rail C. Uh, and then if we come in here, we can do a post dot, or post equals post dot first, and then we can do a post dot undo where it should set this up and now if i do a post dot title we're on foobar three but we should have a post dot or let's just do a post and check this out and we should have uh right here a version four so now we're actually getting the appends to work it looks like so now i should be able to do a post dot switch to the uh first version which is going to be post dot title of test one and we can do a post dot switch to uh, version four, which is going to be our post, uh, oops, our post.title uh, set to our test one again. But we can do the post.switch to three to go to our actual third version because we've now gone to the first version with our undo there. So this is where your history can start to get a little confusing depending on uh, how you have these things structured. So it looks like having this append true is actually the magic trick here to get this to work. Uh, but that's pretty much all I wanted to cover with this. I do apologize for that, that weird bug. That's probably just something that I, I don't fully understand what I was doing. Um, but hopefully you at least got something out of this and you can see sort of where uh, you might want to use something like this. They do also in the readme cover setting up like the uh, whodunit that we used in, I think, audit or paper trail. Uh, where you just set up this method where you can grab the user ID and you can set the user ID so that you can associate it uh, and then you can check uh, which user made these changes as well. So I would suggest going through, as always, the entire readme on your own. The point of these videos is just sort of to expose you to the tool and then say, you know, go forth and, and learn on your own. Uh, but some of this stuff is pretty easy to set up. So I think it'd be a good exercise. But anyways, that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully this was informative and helpful and hopefully I will see you in the next one.